There are three questions that human beings just cannot answer. That is a fact. These questions are huge questions and everybody is asking them. Children are asking them. Teenagers are asking them. Teachers and lecturers are asking them or trying not to have them asked because they can't answer them and the greatest minds on earth are asking them. But though they're asked, nobody is able to satisfactorily answer them. Scientists can't answer them, though they try. Philosophers can't answer them, though they try. And even the religions of the world cannot answer these three questions. What are they? Where did we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? But though we can't answer these three questions, God can. Psalm, or I should say, um, not even Isaiah, let's try again. John, chapter 17, is an incredible chapter. It's an incredible chapter of the Bible because we are presented with a conversation between the eternal Son of God become a man and the Father. Uh, It's sometimes known as Jesus' high priestly prayer because in it, he prays on behalf of his chosen people. So can I encourage you to turn to John 17 with me so that you've got it in front of you? So you can see that what I am saying is not my thoughts, but this is the Word of God. Uh, And in this prayer, these three questions, where did we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? They are all answered. So how did we get here? Well, in a bid to answer this question, some scientists say that there was a a big bang which started off a creative process of evolution. And if you've been to school and if you've been to college, then you will be very familiar with this theory. This big bang, so we're told, in turn led to order and complexity and beauty and everything that we see and all that we don't see in our world today. However, their theories don't give us any credible answer as to what went bang, where it came from, and how you get life from no life. In fact, in looking at the world, we cannot explain how the Big Bang works. Because what is there that is complex and works that didn't have a designer? Computers, cars, our eyes, our brains. The truth is that scientists, some scientists that hold to this view, don't know what happened because they weren't there at the beginning. They couldn't observe it. They can't record it. They can't measure it. They weren't there, but Jesus was. Look at verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. What an incredible thing to say. The glory that I, a man, had with you before the world was. No one else in the whole of history can say that apart from Jesus. Only Jesus came into the world from somewhere else. Some people believe that that our spirits started earlier on, that 
that, that somehow you can have an old spirit, an ancient spirit that comes into your body and then moves on to somewhere else. That our birth is not our beginning, it, it is just part of an ongoing cycle that we originated somewhere else. But this is not what God's Word teaches us. Because right at the beginning of the Bible, when we read about the creation of the world, we're told that God made men and women from the dust of the earth, and then he breathed into their lives the breath of life. They became living souls. And that tells us that every little baby that is in their mother's womb is a living soul. And when that baby is born, he or she starts their life on earth. Life is given by God. It is only Jesus who could say that he was somewhere else before. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that this morning? That Jesus is the eternal Son of God, become man. Because this is essential to our faith. Though Jesus is a real man who had a real birth, he is also God. And this differentiates Jesus from all of the religious leaders who have ever lived. Whether it be those who claimed wisdom like Confucius or revelation like Muhammad or any other religious leader, each one of them is dead and buried or they will die and will come, not come back again. Only Jesus is the eternal Son of God. But what does it mean that he is both God and man? It doesn't mean that he is sort of part God, part man, like some Greek demigod, and that he sort of has to balance the two somehow. He is the God-man. And so whilst, on the one hand, Jesus started off his life like the rest of us by being born, it was a normal birth, it would have hurt, Mary was a sinner, as part of the curse as she gave birth, it, it would have been difficult. He was given a name. You shall call his name Jesus. And, and that was the name he was given at birth in obedience to the angel who revealed it. He had a mum. And though it wasn't his biological father, he had a dad on earth. And he grew up and he learned how to live in this world. He grew in favor with both God and man. He was a real man. A real little boy. But a perfect one. But on the other hand, he was sent from heaven. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. 1 John 4, verse 14. The Father sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world. Let's play the imagination game for just a moment. You imagine the Eternal Father saying to the Eternal Son, Are you ready? Are you ready to take frail flesh and die? And he turns to the Eternal Father and he says, I am ready. It's remarkable, isn't it? The God-man. We read about this miracle of how it happened in Luke chapter 1, verse 35. Because even though in many ways he was a normal child, it was God who put him there. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, was the word to Mary. And the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Only Jesus is qualified to tell us what happened in the beginning because only Jesus was there. 
So how does it apply? In a world that says this is how it happened, there is no God, who are we going to listen to? Them or the eternal Son of God? What does he say? He tells us, verse 17, sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. What does the Bible say? What does the word say? Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What does the Bible say? What does the word say? John 1, verse 3, all things were made through him, that's Jesus Christ, and without him nothing was made that was made. Where did we come from? We came from the triune creator God. And that means that your life, my life, our lives have value because God made us. Where did we come from? We came from the Creator God. But secondly, why are we here? Well, to answer this question, lots of people turn to the philosophers. After all, philosophy is all about wisdom and how to live well. It's the study of living well. However, when faced with the question of what our ultimate meaning and purpose is, there isn't much wisdom to be found. The folks on the streets, uh, when we're talking to people out doing open airs or sharing our faith with others in college, in school, and you say to people, well, well, what do you think life is all about? What is the meaning of life? Why are we here? And after they've made a joke about it's a bit early in the morning for that question, or, or it's a bit early in the afternoon for that question, or it's a bit late in the day for that question, they'll then say, well, I think that life is just about what you make it. They've got no idea. They don't know what life is all about. Why are we here? In fact, one philosopher said this, the literal meaning of life is whatever you're doing that prevents you from killing yourself. What a horrible way to live. Can you remember when there was shooting in a, in, in a gay bar in, um, I think it was in the States, and somebody was interviewed on the back of that shooting, and, uh, and, and they were they were struggling to know what to do on the back of it. And the, and the interviewer said, um, um, so what do you make of all of this? And they said, well, there's just so much terrible things going on in the world. You might as well just enjoy yourself. No meaning. No purpose. Life is whatever you do in order to stop you killing yourself. Can I tell you that life is far better than that? Because there is a God who's made us, who gives our lives, lives value, and there is a great meaning put upon our lives, therefore. What is it? The philosophers, like the rest of us, are in the prison of their own perspective. They can't reach higher than human thought in order to answer the great questions of life. The ceiling is human thinking. They're bound by time and space and capacity and, and all the other things that we are, personal bias and experience. But the God-man Jesus is not so bound. You see, he stepped into time from outside of time. And he stepped into space from outside of space. And he can tell us what it's all about. So what does the Lord Jesus tell us is the meaning of life? Look at verse 3. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Here in one sentence, Jesus tells us what life is all about. That is a sentence worth noting down, memorising, thinking over. And it's all to do with a relationship. And it's not just any relationship. 
Some people can search all of their lives because they are looking for meaning in a relationship. Some people, having got into a relationship, have become increasingly disappointed and disillusioned because they thought that this relationship would give them all that they wanted out of life. But the relationship that gives us meaning is a relationship with God. To love Him. To trust Him. To know Him to enjoy him. One of the great catechisms says, what is the purpose of life? Why are we here? And the answer is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. It's only when we realize this purpose that we begin to find out what true meaning and what true life is all about. One old Christian writer put it like this, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Are you restless this morning? You're part of the church, you're brought up in a Christian family, Outwardly, you've got so much, you've got everything, but inside you're restless. You know, it is true to say that each and every one of us has a God-shaped hole which only God can fill. Success can't fill it. Good results won't fill it. Sex won't fill it. Money can't fill it. Early retirement with enough money in the pocket won't fill it. Great ability and lots of pastimes won't fill it. A relationship, even a stable family, won't fill it. Only Christ can fill it. It's Mr. Bassett's 90th birthday today. What did he often say? I existed until I was converted and then I lived. Are you living today? Only God can satisfy the longing of our souls because we were made for a relationship with Him. And that is where the problem comes. Because as sinful human beings, we've turned away from worshipping our Creator and we have looked to other things in order to fill us. The Bible calls this idolatry. Idolatry is not just the stuff that devout uh, religious people do when they bow down to the idols in their rooms or on pilgrimage. It is what is going on in every single one of us when we put something or someone in the place that only God must have. No wonder everybody is scratching around in the darkness looking for meaning and not finding it They're looking in all the wrong places. And it gets worse. Because the Bible tells us that God is angry with the wicked every day. He is angry for us, with us, excuse me, for turning away from Him. For rejecting His ways and for breaking His laws. For not living in thankfulness, for not honouring Him for not seeking Him, for seeking pleasure in something less. But though He's angry with us, He's also a God of great love. Which is why He sent the Lord Jesus Christ so that we might be brought back to Him. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 has got to be a favorite verse because God demonstrates His love for us in this while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Knowing God, the one true and living God, is what this life is all about. And the only way that we can know Him is through the Lord Jesus Christ, whom He has sent. Let me ask you a question. Do you know Him this morning? How did we get here? God made us. Why are we here? For a relationship with the living God. 
But finally, where are we going? Well, depending on which religion you ask is what answer you will get. And even within different religions, there are many answers. Is it karma? That the spirit just sort of moves on. That uh, whatever you get in this life will come back onto you in this life, and then in the next life it'll be something else. Is it reincarnation, a similar sort of idea? Is it enlightenment, that, that, that everybody is moving towards um, being ag- ab- absorbed into whatever the bright reality is of light and, and nothingness, which means that you've made nirvana? Is it nothing? Is there an afterlife at all? Is it heaven? Is it hell? The truth of the matter is that nobody can answer these questions because nobody has died and come back again. All bar one. The Lord Jesus Christ. As Jesus prayed this prayer in John 17, he knew his time on earth was drawing to a close. He glorified his Father, verse 4. He'd finished the work that he'd come to do. Uh, Yes, he had not yet gone to the cross, but he had taught the people the way to God. He had come and said, um, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. He'd finished the work. And now there was only one thing that stood between him and the glory that awaited him in heaven. The cross. And I don't know if we know the timeline, but it it wasn't long after this high priestly prayer, uh, only a, a matter of moments, we can say, before he was taken by cruel hands. He was betrayed with a kiss. He was arrested. He was taken to a mock trial that lasted through the night, that finished in a brawl as he was spat at and ridiculed and mocked and beaten. He was handed over to Pilate who did just the same and washed his hands of him as the people who had cried out Hosanna only a week earlier, then cried out, crucify him. We will not have this man to rule over us. And then he was put to death and buried in a tomb until gloriously on the third day he rose again from the dead and ascended back to heaven. If you and I were praying knowing that all that was going to come ahead of us, we wouldn't be praying like this, would we? Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus said, if there is any other way, what did he go on to say? Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus died for the sins of his people. He bore their punishment in full so that for whoever believes in him, their sin no longer hangs over them. It's dealt with. The punishment is taken. The penalty is paid. They are pardoned. Their sin is dealt with in full. But when Jesus rose again from the dead, he has come back to tell us what is on the other side. So when I'm having a conversation with people in the open air and they say, well, we could never know, no one's ever come back, I say the resurrection of Jesus Christ proves it. We can know. There is a heaven and there is a hell. Where are we going? If we belong to Jesus then we're going to glory. Look at verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. If we're in Christ, we're going to glory. We're going to be with Jesus. 
This is a lovely prayer of Jesus because it tells us what is at the heart of Jesus' desire for his people. He wants them to be with him. So that when every Christian dies, whether they die young or or they die as an older person, whether they die in tragic situations or from natural causes, this prayer is being answered. I desire that they would be with me where I am. Why does he desire it? Because he loves them. The final destination for every single one who belongs to Christ is eternal life with God. It's not karma. It's not the next thing. It's not nothingness. nothingness. It's heaven. And at the centre of heaven, at the joy of heaven, will to be with Jesus. Remember what Paul said in Philippians? I I, I can't decide what I want, whether I would stay here, which is useful for you, or or whether I would go to be with the Lord, which is far better. Why was it far better? Because for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Friends, the joy of heaven will be to see Jesus. And if that doesn't sound like heaven to you, then perhaps you're not a Christian yet. But if the joy of heaven will be to see Jesus, then surely the pursuit of earth must be to know him. This brings us to two obvious questions as we close. Are we going there, and how do we get there? Our passage speaks about eternal life. Eternal life is a gift from God that comes by faith to all who will believe. And without this gift of eternal life, there is is only eternal death. Not nothingness, not annihilation, death. And that is, according to God's word, eternal conscious punishment away from the loving presence of God, where the worm does not die and where the teeth are always gnashing. How is it to be avoided and heaven gained? When Jesus prayed this prayer, he primarily had the first disciples in mind. But in verse 20, we read these wonderful words. Have a look at it with me, verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, the twelve, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. After Jesus had died and risen again and ascended to the Father, he sent his Holy Spirit to the disciples. And having waited and prayed and being filled with the Spirit, they gave their testimony, they proclaimed their witness, they preached full of the Holy Spirit. And then they did as they were told, they were obedient to the call, they they wrote it down. They wrote down their letters and their epistles. And what we have in the New Testament is their witness. I wonder how we believed Perhaps somebody was speaking on Acts 16 where we hear about the Philippian jailer who fell down on his knees and then cried out, what must I do to be saved? And and in response, Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And we heard those words and we dared to believe that they applied to us and we did believe and we were saved. Perhaps we read read the words in John's Gospel, in, in the letter of John, that says, we love because he first loved us. And we thought, well, I do love him. And if I love him, it must be because he first loved me. And we believed. Perhaps we heard Paul's words saying, if anyone is in Christ, 
He's a new creature. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. Uh, and we can't explain it, but from the moment that we cried out to him for mercy, we recognised a change and we, we knew that we weren't the people that we used to be. And however it was, by their witness, we've been saved. And Jesus prays for us. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it, that the Lord Jesus prays for us. Clever theories about how we got here may be interesting to people who don't want to believe in God, but they're not true. They don't give our lives value. In fact, they leave us with the message that our lives are one big accident, no value. Jesus tells us that our lives are not one big accident, but we were created in the image of God and our lives have great value to him. The philosophers may have their ideas as to what life is all about, but in the end, all of their words don't get us any closer to the truth that is only revealed in God's word. That true life Life that satisfies, life that fulfills, is only found in a relationship with the living God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And whilst the religions of the world want to try and comfort us as to what is coming next, only the truth that is found in Jesus Christ will save us from hell and bring us to heaven. And you know, for the Christian it'll get better and better and better. Proverbs 4 verse 18, the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. For the believer and only the believer, the best is yet to come. Let's pray. Gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning. And we pray, Lord, that that word would not be snatched away by the devil. Uh, Lord, that it wouldn't be choked by the cares and concerns of this life. Uh, Lord, that it wouldn't be received with joy and then rejected at a later date. But that by your Spirit's work within us, it would find good soil and bear fruit. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, our final hymn is number 528. Now none but Christ can satisfy none other name for me. There's love and life and lasting joy, Lord Jesus, found in thee, says the chorus. Let's sing it to God's praise.
now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. <laughs>